Good afternoon. My name is Whitney Witt, and I'm the inaugural dean of the College of Health at Lehigh University. I am so excited to welcome you to this ongoing Population Health Colloquium series. The Population Health Colloquium is a faculty organized series that will continue throughout the summer and focus on COVID-19, examining the most vulnerable populations, social determinants of health, and shining a light on longstanding health inequities. I'm very delighted to introduce our webinar entitled Health Politics and Policy in Response to the COVID-19 Pandemic, moderated by Lehigh's Dr. Eduardo Gomez. I will now turn it over to Dr. Gomez to introduce our leading experts who will be discussing the impacts of political responses in the United States, Latin America, and globally. Thank you Dr. very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dean, Witt, Dean Witt, and thank you all for coming to this special event. It's uh, certainly an honor for all of you to, for us to, for you to join us, and we, we have an excellent group of panelists today uh, for this topic. Let me go ahead and introduce the panelists. The first panelist we have is uh, uh, Professor Christopher Adolph, who's an associate professor in political science at the University of Washington in the Center for, uh, for Statistics and the Social Sciences. He is the author of uh, Bankers, Bureaucrats, and Central Bank Politics. Uh, Dr. Adolf conducts research on comparative political economy, comparative public policy, and quantitative methods. Uh, next, we have uh, Bree Bank Jensen, who is a PhD candidate in political science uh, in a department at, at University of Washington. And her research uh, is focuses on, uh, uh, she does research in state responses to COVID-19. Uh, she also studies factors that lead to deviation in international cooperation and the political effects of, of economic crisis. Next, if we can go to the next slide. Uh, our next uh, participant is Professor Joshua Busby, who's an associate professor at the LBJ School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, Dr. Busby is a distinguished scholar at the Strauss Center for International Security and Law and a non-resident fellow with the Chicago Council of Global Affairs. He has published widely on transnational advocacy movements, climate change, and global health, and has written two books, Moral Movements and Foreign Policy and AIDS, Drugs for All, uh, Social Movements and Market Transformations, and is currently completing a, a book entitled States and Nature, the Effects of Climate Change and security. Next slide, please. Our next group of panelists um, are uh, Professor Richard Snyder from the Department of Political Science at Brown University. Professor Snyder's research and teaching focuses on the comparative politics of development, comparative political economy, and Latin American politics. He's the author of three books, Politics After Neoliberalism, Regulation in Mexico, Passion, Craft, and Method in Comparative Politics, and Inside Countries, Subnational Research in Comparative Politics. Next, we have Eva Rios. She is a PhD student in the Department of Political Science at Brown. And Eva's research focuses on non-state alternatives to public goods and service provision with particular emphasis on criminal organizations and religious groups in Brazil. And finally, we have uh, Cyril Bonona, who's a, also a PhD student in the Department of Political Science at Brown. Uh, and Cyril is a fellow also at the Center for Human Rights and Humanitarian Studies at the Watson Institute. His research focuses on improving access to quality of public services for populations affected by violence and political crisis. He received his master's degree in public health with a focus on humanitarian assistance from Columbia University. Um, I'll go ahead and, and um, introduce the order of the presentation. So we'll first start off with uh, Chris and Bree. Um, and we'll begin uh, uh, with Chris and Bree. Please hold your questions. We'll address your questions at the end for the Q&A after all of the presentations. And so to begin uh, Christopher and Bree's presentation, I thought I'd start for the question for their, for their presentation. The question that I have is how have political scientists studied social distancing policy in the US and what new political and policy lessons have emerged? So with that, I'd like to turn that over to Chris and Bree. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Eduardo, for that kind introduction. Look, really looking forward to presenting today. Uh, next, please. So in the absence of effective treatment or vaccines to respond to COVID-19, the big approach countries and states have been taking is social distancing. Obviously, individuals can choose to social distance on their own, but it seems to work best when there's a clearly defined government mandate and when that mandate is supported by appropriate economic policies. 
we've seen some success with this in the EU. In contrast, uh, both due to federalism and uh, seemingly intentional neglect, the US federal government abdicated responsibility for the COVID-19 response to the states. And what we've seen is a rapidly accelerating catastrophe. Next. So what explains variation in responses in the US? Research by political scientists suggests that both individual and state mandated social distancing differences in the US have been intensely partisan. There are a number of really interesting studies that show Republican voters have been less likely to adopt social distancing, to reduce their mobility, even to Google COVID-19 related topics than their independent or democratic counterparts. But what we've tried to explore in our research is not differences in individual behavior, but differences in policies implemented by elected officials and the determinants of those policies. And what we found is that Republican governors have been slower to adopt and quicker to ease social distancing mandates across many categories. We'll be presenting on that finding today, which will be in a forthcoming uh, journal article. And we'll also be presenting on some exciting new results for the first time today. And this has been, I'd be remiss not to mention, this has been a collaborative project by a pretty large team at the University of Washington. Next, please. So, in mid-March, we began looking at state executive orders to cold their adoption of social distancing measures. Next, please. So initially, we focused on five different measures that I'll be looking th going through, and we post daily updates on those to uh, covid19statepolicy.org. Next, please. And this volunteer effort has informed a number of forecasting models as well as tools. Uh, next. So the above graphic focuses on state early response from the very end of February when community detection was first um, sort of spotted in the US through to early April. Uh, this graphic combines uh, adoption of restriction on gatherings to adoption of recommendations not to gather. And we see that while states were a little bit slow to um, implement gathering restrictions in March, by uh, the end of the first week of April, every state uh, except Arkansas has some form of gathering restriction. Okay, this next slide looks at school closures and school closures followed behind gathering restrictions in a lot of states, but also became very widespread by the first week of April. And many of these closures are still in effect. Obviously this has become a very controversial and uh, charged topic in the past week. Next please. We also looked at restrictions on restaurants. In most cases, this takes the form of saying restaurants can offer takeout, but they can't have in patron dining. Uh, we see a little less universal adoption of this than school closures and gatherings, but still it's a strategy that most states have used. Next. Okay, so another strategy uh, some states use to mandate social distancing was the closure of non-essential businesses. This was a little bit less universal. Only about 60% of states mandated the closure of non-essential businesses. And we also observed a tremendous amount of variation in how essential and non-essential businesses were defined across states. Next, please. So another area where there was a lot of variation between states is the adoption of stay-at-home orders. We saw about 38% of states, um, uh, sorry, not 38%, 38 states introduced some form of stay-at-home order. Um, we also saw advisories, stay-at-home advisories in states like Massachusetts, New Mexico, and Utah. And some states didn't have stay-at-home policies at all. Okay, next please. So overall, we found that some states followed a pattern of ramping up social distancing over March and April. Uh, some states introduced as many as all five measures, whereas other states took many fewer steps. Next, please. 
what explains this variation? Uh, states faced a lot of uncertainty about the effects of COVID-19, the appropriate policy response, and there was no coordinated centralized guidance. So why was there so much variation in governor behavior? Next slide. So to figure this out, we pooled all five state policies, all five social distancing policies by state day and fit a Cox proportional hazard model to the data. Next, please. So what we found is that the most important correlate of delays in state social distancing measures was actually the party of the governor and that on average Republican governors delayed each measure by two days. We tested a number of other covariates. We're happy to discuss this more in Q&A, but some that are especially interesting is initially we thought that less dense states might feel less pressure to introduce social distancing as they have a bit more social distancing built in. Um, lower population density had a much weaker effect than the party of the governor. Another thing we sort of hoped would have a strong effect on the behavior of governors is the number of cases in a state. If you have a lot of cases, you would think you'd want to adopt more restrictions than if you have fewer cases. Um, however, what we observed is that the number of cases in the state had a very weak effect on the timing of introduction of social distancing policies. Next slide, please. So is two days a big delay? Given uncertainty about how widespread the virus was in March, and its exponential rate of growth, it was a potentially disastrous delay. And moreover, it foreshadowed a pattern of premature easing of these social distancing policies. So far, I've been speaking about the initial period of COVID-19 policy in the US, and now I'm going to virtually pass the mic to my co-presenter, uh, Chris Adolf, to talk about what came next. Thanks, Bree. Uh, next, okay, good. Uh, so we've seen the early phase, but we're now in a resurgence of COVID. And I think it's no news to anyone watching that the United States and Europe initially had similar uh, bursts in uh, COVID-19. Europe got it under control. They flattened the curve and have moved to reopen and trace uh, contacts of new cases. The United States has had a dramatic resurgence. Uh, next slide. So. To deal with this, our team has continued to track and post online uh, the state's efforts first to ease uh, through April, May, and June, uh, the measures they had implemented, and then how they're re-expanding those measures. Next slide, please. Uh, what we're going to show here is preliminary research uh, on the date of first easing uh, in each state. So this is the date at which uh, states took initial actions, in this case, on this slide, to ease restaurant restrictions, regardless of whether those steps were large or small. Notice this graph is now showing weeks of change. Next slide. There's a lot of variation in the timing of first easing, basically a six week period from the middle of March through the uh, end of May or beginning of June, but all states had taken some steps to ease by that point. If we look at non-essential business closures of the, the most stringent of all of the social distancing measures, we see a similar pattern. Um, next slide, please. Stay at home orders as well, uh, ramped down over the same period. Here there's just one state that hasn't eased uh, stay at homes. It's a technicality where California has essentially delegated to the counties uh, that decision, but effectively everyone has made some measures to ease this. Next slide, please. Gathering restrictions on the other hand, in many cases have not been eased. The, the earliest measure taken and probably the last to be fully relaxed, but even here, uh, most states have at least made some efforts to allow larger gatherings uh, than before or to perhaps allow outdoor gatherings. Next slide. The area that when we wrote these slides a few days ago uh, had seen the least change is school closures and that's still true where basically half of states still have their maximal policies but there are massive battles heating up over this across the states and in the federal government. Next slide. So you see the mirror image of the ramp up, but over a longer period of time where states gradually move from having never eased any of their five policies or four policies that they had uh, to having eased essentially every state has eased at least uh, something um, and very few states have even two uneased policies left. 
The question is, was this driven by politics or by public health? And so we uh, perform a similar analysis to our analysis of the initial easing. Now we're looking at how accelerated, sorry, this is analogous to our anal analysis of the initial implementation of these policies. Now we're looking at how accelerated easings are. So this plot shows the results from another Cox model uh, predicting holding everything else constant what the effect of say politics is and at the, the top of this chart you see the combined partisan effect that's the effect of having a republican governor and more trump voters than the typical state but holding everything else equal uh, you would expect in any given area to see the first step towards easing about two and a half weeks earlier than a state that is a, essentially a blue state and this breaks up into an effect of having more trump voters and, more, and having Republican governors, each of which contribute at least a week early easing. This is a huge effect compared to everything else here. Um, if you look uh, at, at the bottom of this chart, we see essentially no effect of declining rates of new cases. The public health indicator we use in this analysis is uh, the seven day moving average of the rate of growth of new cases. So we might expect uh, that as that rate of growth declines, states would be more likely to start using their social distancing policies. That's certainly what the CDC guidelines and many of the state's own guidelines suggested they would do. In practice, it was essentially driven by politics and there's basically no correlation with public health indicators. This is preliminary research. Um, these results are provisional, but uh, the consistency with our, our first set of results that are forthcoming in the general health politics policy and law is really striking and kind of heartbreaking, if not surprising. Uh, next slide, please. So the last thing I want to talk about in just, for just a minute is the latest phase of policy debates in the states, which is over mandatory masking. It's pretty clear that compared to New York State or most of Europe, most US states opened their economies too early, perhaps by as much as a month. With the virus surging almost everywhere and reaching crisis proportions in Florida, Texas, and Arizona, Governors have paused further easing, but there hasn't been too much re-implementation yet. Instead, governors hoping to avoid the pain of renewed expansion of social distancing are in many cases turning to mandate mask wearing. 17 governors at the time we made this slide, a couple more now, uh, have implemented such mandates, mostly Democrats, but recently Governor Abbott of Texas and Justice of West Virginia. Um, but the problem is Trump prominently refuses to wear a mask and mask wearing is far less common among Republican partisans. Next slide, please. So here are very provi provisional results on public mask, mask uh, mandates. This is a fast moving area. This is data through July 5th. And we once again see a massive effect of Republican governors in party politics. Two weeks later, perhaps, on mandating public masks. Once again, there's no relationship essentially with the rate of case growth. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide. Okay, so this is a caveat to this. This is rapidly emerging and we're focused on mandates. There doesn't seem to be any pattern here with respect to recommendations to wear masks, but actual orders to wear masks appear so far to be partisan, but watch this space. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna wrap up with two questions. First, why is social distancing policy so consistently partisan? And there are three reasons. First is a lack of support from the president for governors who might otherwise impose stricter ma mandates. Trump has amplified right-wing opposition to social distancing measures. Remember him calling to liberate various democratic states from social distancing. He still says the virus is just gonna disappear and he still won't lead by example on masks or public gatherings. More broadly, federal uh, response has been deeply inadequate on everything from PPE to uh, resources for testing to now guidance on school reopening. So governors that want to, uh, to do something better don't have any support. And that matters because there's pressure from Republican voters. On average, Republican voters have been less observant of social distancing, less likely to wear masks, more opposed to mandated closures. And that doesn't give Republican governors move to, room to maneuver. They're afraid of primary challenges more than anything. And of course, Republicans are less likely to trust public health experts like Anthony Fauci. So last slide, please. So will this remain partisan? We keep hoping this pattern will change. Every time we run a new analysis, we hope this time everyone will have woken up to this emerging catastrophe because we can't basically afford these divisions across states or individuals on party lines. But it's very difficult to imagine President Trump ever acknowledging his mistakes. Maybe a few co-partisans are jumping ship right? Uh, Abbott at least uh, mandated masks and rising proportions of individual Americans are wearing masks 
and worrying about easing too early. But at the same time, we see just new battlefields over schools and gatherings that won't go away even as this crisis reaches a new peak. And so the question is, if, if turning to masks to keep our economy open, to re requiring people to be responsible isn't enough, will we see new uh, social distancing measures imposed soon and will it be partisan? That's a question that will be answered in the next few days and weeks. Uh, and I, I'm afraid we already suspect we know the answer. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, Chris and Bree, and uh, fantastic uh, presentation and, and uh, very illuminating. Uh, next, we have uh, Professor Joshua Busby uh, from the University of Texas, and I'm going to again start with a question uh, for Joshua. Um, and the question is, what can the field of international relations tell us about how the international community has responded to COVID-19? So, Joshua? Thank you for the invitation and greetings from Texas. Um, if you follow the news over the last 24 hours, you likely saw that the United States formally sent a letter uh, beginning its withdrawal from the World Health Organization. It's questionable legally, won't take effect for a year, and will be immediately undone by Joe Biden if he's elected president, but underscores what can only be described as an glo anemic global response to the COVID crisis. So where we might have expected cooperation, we've seen uh, feuding uh, between the United States and China, between the United States and the World Health Organization. And despite some efforts of global coordination, we appear to be mostly in a world of every country for itself. Now, th this was underscored last week when news broke the United States had uh, bought up for the next three months the entire global supply of remdesivir, an antiviral drug made by Gilead that is thought to reduce hospital stays of those suffering from COVID. And as we move closer uh, to having uh, more therapeutics and a vaccine, there's a fear that we're entering into an era of pharmaceutical nationalism where wealthy countries uh, commandeer all the resources for themselves. And all of these developments raise the question, why has the international response to COVID been so lackluster? So I'm a political scientist by training and my field is international relations. And I've been writing about global health for two decades. And I followed the COVID crisis closely starting in January. And in April, I wrote a lengthy essay on this question on the global response for EIR a blog and a shorter version of the argument appeared in May in the Journal of Health, Politics, Policy and Law. So in the long essay, I, I use international relations to walk through why the response has been so poor. It, one of the leading scholars in the field, the late uh, Ken Waltz, used the metaphor of images of analysis to help us understand the world. First image theories focus on the role of individuals. Second image theories focus on the role of larger units in the international system. In this case, it would be nation states. And then uh, third image theories focus on qualities and characteristics of the broader international system. And what I do in the piece is apply all three images to underscore why no single image adequately explains why, where we are. Um, so I start with systemic theories. I start with these third image theories. On the one hand, we have Waltz's own argument about anarchy, that is the absence of an overarching world government, which makes countries have to rely on themselves for their own protection. And usually we think of that in terms of self-defense against armed attack, but it might apply equally well to fight off disease. On the other hand, we live in a world of complex interdependence in which our fates are bound up with each other. No single state can defeat this virus on its own. Countries depend upon each other uh, for imports of medical equipment from others. And the nature of infectious disease is such that an outbreak anywhere poses a threat to all states everywhere. But interdependence doesn't automatically uh, select for and determine cooperation. Indeed, as Abe Newman and Henry Farrell have noted interdependence can also be weaponized and states can use others' dependence on them to extract concessions. And so realization of the risks of interdependence can lead to demands for decoupling of supply chains as we've seen elevated of late in discussions about pharmaceuticals. Now, of course, there are collective action problems that make this a challenge, make forging cooperation a challenge, but the history of global health is in the modern era has actually been pretty good in terms of global cooperation, at least compared to other issues like uh, the environment and climate change that I also study, where states have more divergent interests. It is this powerful incentive to cooperate which helps us explain why the US and the Soviet Union, despite their differences, work together to eradicate smallpox and why countries today are trying to do the same for polio. So here we would expect much more cooperation Indeed, states create international organizations like the World Health Organization precisely to help them do the work of coordination, 
of knowledge development and sharing, of standard setting, of capacity building in poor countries, and other essential functions to, prepare, to prevent and respond to global challenges. So international organizations help countries do things together that most of them cannot do on their own, and they have greater legitimacy and are able to collect information from member states that they might not be willing to share with, say, a potential adversary. So the World Health Organization was up to the task in the late 1970s in the eradication of smallpox, but its record has been more mixed in the contemporary era. Whose response to the 2014 Ebola outbreak in, in West Africa was desultory. Um, one of its powers granted as part of the 2005 reform of the international health regulations is to declare public health emergencies of international concern. And these are intended to be sort of a global fire alarm to direct attention to emergent health problems. However, such declarations can also be economically harmful to countries or regions. So the WHO might be reluctant to make such a declaration if it means subjecting a country or region to lost travel and trade. And that several month delay happened in 2014 for West Africa. And the delay in making the declaration was thought to cost the region dearly. Then 11,000 people died and the virus was only contained and stamped out after the region began changing practices around burials and the international community mobilized response. So part of whose failure on Ebola was a function of its parlous finances and gets at the weakness of international organizations generally. In the wake of the 2008 financial crisis, who had its budget dramatically reduced by member states with many of those cuts falling on pandemic preparedness and emergency response. That was addressed to some extent in the wake of Ebola, but other issues remain. In the COVID crisis, WHO declared a public health emergency in late January. Now it could have come maybe a week earlier, but the world first learned of this around January 1. So this was reasonably fast compared to Ebola. However, under those international health regulations or IHR, countries are required to report emergent outbreaks to WHO and provide more detail on novel health threats. But WHO has no means to compel states to provide that information, particularly problematic vis-a-vis -vis powerful states like China. So who was trying in January to get a team into China to see the situation for themselves? And China was reluctant to allow the team in. So whose leadership under Dr. Tedros in late January said some very complimentary things about the Chinese response as a diplomatic nicety. And the team goes in February and gets vital information about the nature of the disease and how to respond to it. And as we know now, China's willingness to be forthcoming and whose praise of China's response become critical issues of contention between the US and China and the US and WHO leading up to the announcement yesterday. But from an international relations perspective, WHO is an agent of what member states are willing to do and willing to fund. And the fact is, WHO is not well resourced enough to do all the things that is expected to do. It is not empowered enough to force states to do what they don't want to do. Who has tried to foster international cooperation with a universal access initiative on vaccine development and medical supplies, but neither the US nor China initially joined. So while the WHO may have its flaws and may have been overly solicitous of China and the emergence of COVID, there's a reason for that, which is a function of the weakness of almost every international organization. So the upshot of these structural observations on anarchy, interdependence, and international organizations is that cooperation or conflict on COVID is not structurally determined. There are forces for and against. Now, now let, me, let me say one more thing on structure and then I'll talk about the two other dimensions briefly. In the past, we have gotten cooperation when there was one leading state in the international system or hegemon uh, willing to step out in front and underwrite cooperative endeavors. However, the world is experiencing a power transition of sorts with the relative decline of the United States and the rise of China. So this is a dangerous moment because you might have a declining hegemon less able to provide collective goods and another uh, not able to either. And what may be more important though than capacity is the declining state's willingness to encourage cooperation, which we cannot explain with structural explanations alone. And so for that, we need second image or unit level explanations that focus on the nature of the governments that could provide that leadership. So are there attributes of the leading states in the US and China that make them less likely or able to provide leadership singly or together? So China's authoritarian system made it susceptible to underreporting of crises and negative information, but it also facilitated its draconian response to COVID that was reasonably successful. Democratic systems, on the other hand, are thought to be better able to respond to crises because politicians have to be more sensitive to their constituents for reelection purposes and because of a free press. However, 
fragmented federal systems like we just heard about, like the United States, may be poorly situated to develop coherent collective responses. Moreover, I'd argue that democratic decline in the US is making the US less responsive to citizen needs at the same time federalism means the capacity to respond is also weak. Hence, we have 50,000 new cases a day of COVID in the United States right now. Now, these observations speak to the problems of democratic response, but what about the nature of these two systems and the international response? Here, we have a democratic regime and an authoritarian regime interacting. The literature in international relations suggests that cooperation across different regime types may be harder as a consequence of authoritarian countries being less able to make credible commitments, since whims of an autocrat can change since they face few institutional checks. However, this is an issue that demands cooperation. Numerous observers, again, going back to the smallpox example, the US and the Soviet Union were able to cooperate in the midst of the Cold War. So I would argue that the anemic response to COVID isn't determined by regime type. That said, there are other domestic political incentives that may make cooperation more challenging. Both Xi Jinping and Donald Trump may be using blaming the other for their own failures as a means of bolstering their domestic standing. And we see such manifestations in the Trump administration's efforts to label the virus as the Wuhan or Chinese flu at the G7 and UN Security Council and its effort to walk away from the World Health Organization. But if these explanations are right, they cannot just be the idiosyncratic reflections of a single person. Increasing centralization in China has elevated the views of Xi Jinping and what serves into interests, though the opaqueness of that system makes it harder to discern how much is a function of the role of the individual. Uh, but individual level explanations and the role of President Trump are easier to observe in the US. And, and here I'm moving into the uh, 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 first image explanations. While such big men theories of international relations went out of vogue, more recent studies have sought to bring uh, the role of key individuals, their life experiences and worldviews back into the picture when we think about crisis response. And here it is difficult to argue that the road the US has taken on COVID cooperation would be the one that almost any other elected official would take. Is there any doubt that the US couldn't do more to foster a global response if it wanted to? It is not a, a poor country and supporting the global response would not be expensive compared to the cost of a train wrecked economy. Now, structural decline in American democracy has made the US more like an autocratic system. Uh, subject to Trump's uh, own perceived political needs and ideological views, which include longstanding skepticism of multilateral organizations and the perception that the US is being ripped off by allies. The decline in domestic institutions and checks means that Trump is now freer to let his family have an outsized role in the domestic response. Think of Jared Kushner's role in coordinating mobilization of protective health equipment. Internationally, Trump's views loom large on who withdraw, labeling of China both as a friend and excellent on COVID response one day and then turning on them the next. He is not constrained and he has replaced those hostile to his views with agents like Mike Pompeo, Secretary of State, who either share his views or are happy to be instruments of the president's wishes in the services of their own professional ambitions. So I conclude that the rise of two personalist authoritarian systems between the US and China on some level is a structural property, not simply about the role of the individual. That makes relations highly unstable, subject to whether these two men see it in their interest to get along. At the moment, they don't, and the structural pressures from the emergent power transition internationally make the prospects dim so long as both men hold the positions they hold and their domestic political rewards favor conflict. So that's grim news, but it helps us understand why we are where we are. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Joshua, for that uh, amazing uh, presentation on international uh, responses to, to COVID-19. Uh, next, we'll have uh, Richard C Cyril and Eva from Brown University. And the question that I have for them is, uh, what new insights uh, does the field of comparative politics provide for our study of COVID-19 in Latin America? Richard? Great. Thank you, uh, Ed, and thanks to uh, everyone at Lehigh for hosting this and for inviting us to participate. Um, <clears throat> at the outset, I just wanted to thank you uh, to point out that this is a team of six. Three of us are here. Um, we decided that uh, we keep all the good looking, best looking folks away um, and not have them participate. You can see them here, uh, Agustina Geraldi at American University of Guadalmoncada at, at Barnard Columbia and my colleague at Brown University, Paul Testa, are part of the, part of the team. And uh, what we're gonna do, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start by introducing 
the material, and then I'll turn things over to Cyril and then Eva. They're going to discuss the cases as well as some issues about how we define and measure um, our dependent variable, the outcome of interest, which is policy responses, especially policy responses to COVID-19 at the subnational state level um, across countries. So at the outset, I just wanted to uh, emphasize that Latin America is really a hot spot these days for COVID uh, cases. The region as a whole, Latin America as a whole, has about 3 million cases of COVID-19 and 130,000 deaths. That's about 25%, one quarter of the total cases in the world, as well as the total um, deaths in the world. Yet the region has just 8% of the world population. So clearly and unfortunately, Latin America is an overachiever uh, in terms of the, of the epidemic at this point. Also, of the 10 countries in the world that have the highest number of cases, of COVID cases, four of the top 10 are in Latin America. That's Brazil, Peru, Chile, and Mexico. Um, also, if uh, you take a look at the, the slides here, no, please go back. Thank you. These slides, what we see here are the, uh, on the left, the cumulative cases for the federal systems of the Americas, through democratic federal systems of the Americas, three in Latin America, Argentina, Brazil, Mexico, and then of course, Canada, the United States. And on the right, we see the cumulative cases weighted by population per 100,000. And the takeaway is not just the the variance here in the in the amount of cases, but also the steepness of the curves, and we see that the the curve in Brazil is very steep, and if you look to the right for the population adjusted figure, it's also quite steep in Mexico and Argentina. So, so it's an alarming situation in this hotspot region of the world, Latin America. Um, we have chosen to focus in our research project, which by the way is, is very preliminary and initial and ongoing, like most research on, uh, on the pandemic. And we've chosen to focus on federal systems. So why federalism? First of all, more than half of Latin America's citizens, nearly 400 million people out of a 600 million, live in federations. That is in Brazil, in Mexico, or Argentina, the democratic federations. Um, of the region. And also a focus on federalism provides a good counterpoint with work on the United States, which is also federal, um, as we just saw in the earlier presentation. And colleagues in American politics have, have been uh, making some interesting advances studying COVID politics. So looking at other federal systems is a good way to bring in some comparative uh, perspectives. Also, as we've detected in our research and one can gather from the, the news, the COVID pandemic is very much politically about executives, political executives. And this is true of crises in general. Often crises allow political executives and democratic systems to come to the fore, set the agenda. And political executives in include presidents, obviously, at the federal national level, but there are lots of subnational political executives, governors, especially at the state level. And that's true in the United States as well as in Mexico, Brazil, and Argentina in Latin America's federal presidential um, systems. Um, and lastly, I just have a special and longstanding interest in comparative subnational and multi-level uh, politics. And I and other colleagues have published the book Inside Countries uh, with Agustin Arradi, Eduardo Moncada, and, and others, um, which tells you about subnational comparative politics research. Okay, so a word of caution at the outset about the data that you're looking at uh, in these graphs and data in general on COVID rates and deaths uh, in Latin America and probably more generally. Um, for example, in the point is that the data often undercounts both the rate of COVID infections as well as deaths. Two quick examples, a recent study on uh, slums or favelas in urban Brazil found that, uh, that perhaps up to, the rate of infection was perhaps up to 30 times higher than the officially registered count. 
Also, a recent World Health Organization study found that testing levels were still quite low in Brazil with a very high percentage of positive results. And this combination of a low testing rate, high positive results, probably means there are more cases out there than reported. So, uh, okay, let's go to the next slide. Thank you. These are the federal systems that we're looking at in our study. And you know, this table just quickly shows you some of the core commonalities as well as differences uh, across them. At the top, you see these are all presidential federations. Um, interestingly, three of the countries, Brazil, Mexico, and the US, all have a similar type of presidential leadership, populist, anti-science, anti-expertise, presidential leadership. Um, two presidents on the right, ideologically, Trump in the US and President Bolsonaro in Brazil, and one on the left, uh, President AMLO or Lopez Obrador, who's currently visiting the US uh, today to meet with President Trump, who's on the left. Um, they're all, the Latin American cases are quite similar in terms of the power of state governments vis-a-vis -vis federal governments measured by things like their fiscal autonomy, autonomy, ability to tax and set taxes on their own. Um, and interestingly and quite importantly, the bottom two rows, in terms of party systems, there's some very important differences. The US is basically a two-party system, a stable two-party system, Republicans and Democrats. Um, and that stability and two-partiness sometimes makes it easier to, to understand uh, US politics perhaps than let's say in Brazil, where we have a multi-party system. And if you look at that number 18.01, that's an index called the effective number of parties. That's a lot of political parties uh, in Brazil. Mexico and Argentina are also multi-party with on average just over four effective number of parties. Um, and then the last line there, which we'll get to in a bit, is whether or not there's a populist movement or party that's led by the president. Um, next slide, please. So just to show you uh, who we're talking about here, here we have Lopez Obrador on the left and President Bolsonaro of Brazil on the right. And here's Bolsonaro, he's holding up a, a six leaf clover, which he publicly uh, claimed was an amulet that would protect him and presumably others from infection by COVID. Uh, next slide, next thick picture, please. Here we see President Trump um, touting the virtues of of Clorox uh, for also protecting one from, from infection. Uh, so this is not just simply something uh, that Latin American presidents do, obviously. And of course, as I said, Lopez Obrador is politically on the left, not on the right. Here on the right, we see uh, Bolsonaro, who famously, who's actually just tested positive for COVID-19, if you've been following the news. And he has likened uh, COVID-19 to just being a small flu. Here you can see him um, disregarding uh, public health expertise by posing for selfies with people uh, in early April uh, without a mask and, and so forth. So these are the, the presidents. I wanna hand things over now to, to Cyril, who's going to talk about uh, the outcome of interest, the dependent variable policy stringency, both across and especially inside within countries. Cyril? Uh, thanks, Rich. Uh, next slide, yeah. Uh, and thank you to the earlier presenters. Those were excellent and I really learned a lot. So thank you also to Lehigh for, for including us in this. Um, so, you know, as Rich said, we're really interested in understanding in these federalist, populist, democracies in the Western Hemisphere, what explains variation in uh, stringency, policy stringency? And what do we mean by policy stringency? If you look on the right-hand side of the slide, you'll see these nine dimensions, uh, which you'll also notice maybe uh, correspond very closely to what our earlier presenters uh, from the University of Washington presented. And, and that's no coincidence, uh, we should acknowledge that we did not collect uh, this data related to uh, stringency and we have an enormous debt of gratitude 
to a number of teams across the world uh, that have been uh, collaborating in order to make these data available to the public. So I would definitely recommend looking at the data uh, from University of Washington, as well as uh, the Oxford uh, National Stringency Index and uh, the University of Miami Observatory's um, subnational uh, stringency index. And we, you know, special thanks to Michael uh, touched in there, who uh, really helped us uh, put together these, the, the outcome and a number of these uh, graphs. But what we want to really understand here is these political explanations uh, for variation in stringency, both at the national and at the subnational level. And I'll go into a little bit more detail about what that means. But first, I would just draw your attention to the graph on the left hand side, where we see uh, what I mean by tremendous variation. Uh, in national stringency scores. You can see uh, the blue line all the way at the top is the most stringent, uh, and that's Argentina. Then you can see in the middle is Mexico, all the way at the bottom is uh, Brazil, and then all the uh, lighter gray lines are, are other countries. Uh, next slide, please. But in addition to this, this variation in national stringency scores, you can see at the subnational level, and by this I mean states, so equivalent to US states, uh, tremendous variation in subnational um, stringency scores. So on the left hand side within Brazil, uh, the hashed line in the center is the, is the national stringency score. And then you can see uh, the outer bounds there, uh, all the way at the bottom is, is the least stringent, all the way at the top is the most stringent, and then a huge amount of variation uh, between those bounds. On the right hand side, again, you can see in Mexico, uh, not quite as much variation, but still uh, a great deal. So we want to understand what this is all about. Uh, next slide, please. So um, here we have a couple of, of GIFs, which are just fun to look at to just drive the point home here that not only is there DV, uh, not only is there variation in stringency, but that stringency, uh, what we're very interested in is how it deviates from that national average. So uh, if it, the white um, states on the left hand side in Brazil are ones that have no deviation. Uh, as we go across time, we see that some states turn bluer and bluer or more purple and more purple. Those are the ones that are deviating positively. In other words, they're becoming more stringent than the national. The ones that are deeper and deeper red or orange um, are the ones that are less stringent than the national. Now, moving over to Mexico, you can see a, a very similar uh, sense of variation in deviation. So this really should drive home the point that there's a great amount of variation and uh, and this is an outstanding puzzle. Um, next slide. Which we're hoping to be able to start providing some answers to, though as Rich mentioned, all of these findings are quite preliminary. Now, starting here, we can see the uh, left-leaning party of Obrador in Mexico uh, on the left-hand side. These graphs uh, are per state. Uh, and they demonstrate uh, changes in, in uh, stringency over time. And as you see here in red, uh, all of these states that uh, are graphed corresponding to the Morena party are uh, less stringent than the national. Um, now, next slide. As we move over to the right-leaning PAN party, uh, we actually see that uh, more often than not, though there, of course, are some um, exceptions here, some the states that correspond to the PAN party seem to have greater stringency than the national. So, and then uh, this, this third image here at the bottom shows uh, additional parties aside from the PAN. So when we run this through uh, regressions, what we find is that uh, it's not about the particular party. It's not necessarily about the party's ideology, but it's about the alignment or misalignment with the president uh, in power. So the more aligned the, the uh, governor's party tends to be with Morena, the less stringent, and the less aligned, the more stringent. And I, I think this creates a really interesting uh, point of comparison with the earlier presentation and with what we, uh, you know, in, in the national climate in the U.S. have been discussing uh, with regards to Republicans and Democrats. You know, the outstanding question when we say that states led by Republican governors uh, are less, are, are demonstrating less stringency with, uh, uh, with regard to COVID-19, it's difficult to determine, as uh, I believe Professor Adolph mentioned, it's, it's difficult to determine 
what degree that has to do with uh, ideological belief and leaning, uh, to what degree it has to do with uh, alignment and political incentives. And so that's something uh, that we think uh, we are contributing to uh, here with this finding related to alignment. Next slide, please. And so this uh, is just a repeated slide from earlier where we're looking at the case selection and you can see that we have tried to um, find similarities across these sites. And so this gives us a little bit more confidence uh, in our preliminary finding that um, what we're seeing in Mexico likely has to do with, with political alignment. But of course, that's not the entire story in Mexico and it's certainly not the entire story uh, in Brazil. So I'll pass it over to our colleague Eva to, to walk us through that much more uh, complex, politically complex case. Thank you. So um, if we can go to the next slide. Thanks. Um, okay, so as we move from uh, Mexico to Brazil, the story becomes more complicated. Going back to this table with the features of the presidential federations, we just want to highlight what we think of as another key difference between these countries, which is their party system. Brazil has 18 effective parties, which is many more than the rest of these federations. And not only does it have more, but these parties are also a lot more fluid. So politicians will change parties and the coalitions across parties also frequently change. Next slide. Moving into some of our initial results, if you could get the full slide. Thank you. Um, if you remember, so presented similar graphs for subnational policy deviation in Mexico. So just to reiterate, blue is the national policy. Red indicates that the state has deviated negatively and green indicates that it has deviated positively. So up in this slide, we have included uh, four of the 14 parties, uh, but we think that these are some of the more important parties and they represent both the left with the PSB and the PT and the right with the PSC and the PSL. So as you can see, um, we're not observing the same pattern in Brazil that we just saw in Mexico. There's very little consistency in policy stringency deviation across these states within the same party. Uh, some states within the same party enacting more stringent policies than the national level and other states are enacting policies that are less stringent. Um, overall, we are finding that in Brazil, party is not strongly or significantly associated with policy stringency at the subnational level. So we wanna uh, take a look at three of the cases from this slide to try to understand why Brazilian states are less consistent in their deviations than they were in Mexico or the US. Uh, so the first case we're gonna look at is Rio de Janeiro, which demonstrates um, how alignment with the president doesn't explain the outcome. Uh, then Hondonia, which demonstrates how the governor's party doesn't explain the outcome. And finally, Seattle, which demonstrates how ideology doesn't explain uh, stringency deviation at the from the national level. So starting with Rio de Janeiro, uh, you have Governor Wilson Witzel. He's a member of the conservative PSC party, uh, which Bolsonaro used to be a member of. Uh, Wilson and Bolsonaro were allies up until Witzel disagreed with Bolsonaro's uh, COVID response. Uh, he referred to it as a crime against humanity. Um, so across these PSC states, you can see Amazonas on the top left, which has deviated very little from the national policy. And then you have Rio de Janeiro, which has uh, deviated slightly positively. Um, and so in Rio, you have this governor who is a former close ally of the president and now considered his political rival. And it has a policy stringency score that deviates um, just a little bit. So if we uh, go to the next slide and look at um, Hondonia. Hondonia is um, another conservative state. So like in Rio, uh, Hondonia, the governor, Rocha, has been a supporter of Bolsonaro. Um, he is the only governor that has um, announced his intention to join Bolsonaro's new party, which is called the Alliance for Brazil. But unlike in Rio de Janeiro, um, Hosha has not come out against Bolsonaro for his response to COVID, which is particularly puzzling when we take into account that Hondonia has the highest policy stringency score of any of the 27 Brazilian states. Um, it deviates higher across all, um, not across, but it has the highest deviation. Um, and then again, looking within or across the PSL states, it's not consistent. So you have Horaima, which has a lower policy stringency score than the national level, and Santa Catarina, which positively deviates from the national level, but has a governor that, like Witzel, has turned his back on Bolsonaro. Next slide. Uh, you might expect uh, Hondonia's high policy score um, of in states with governors and ideologies that are more progressive. So the PT is one of Brazil's most established parties. It has consistently supported many social programs, uplifting the poor and working class. The PT stronghold has always been in the northeast of the country, which has uh, been one of the largest hotspots of Brazil so far. 
But if we look at Seattle specifically, which is in the Northeast and has a Pete governor, its policy stringency is deviating below the national level. So like the other parties that I've also highlighted, Pete states are also inconsistent in their policy deviation. You can see Bahia is deviating um, above the national level and Seattle and uh, briefly Piau were deviating below. Uh, so in this complex multi-party system of Brazil, neither party nor ideology nor alignment with Bolsonaro appear to be strongly associated with policy stringency deviation. Um, I'm going to hand it back to Rich to close this out. Great. Next slide, please. Thanks, uh, Eva and Cheryl. Sorry, we're going a little over, but we've got the biggest team of three and the most countries to cover. So sorry. Uh, I'm going to just try to wrap it up very, very quickly uh, here. So what are, what's the takeaway? So in these democratic federal systems that all have populist anti-science presidents, governors at the state level have considerable margins of maneuverability to do something different, to adopt more stringent policies that are more in line with public health expertise. That's one of the takeaways. Um, second takeaway involves how can we explain these contrasting varied state level policy responses? Well, that's complicated. Um, is it public health or politics as uh, our colleagues from Washington pose the question? Well, it, we're not gonna show this in our statistical analysis. We do control for some public health factors, a particular number of cases to isolate uh, the role of politics in explaining policy responses. And the most likely suspect, let's, let's start there, which certainly works in the US is partisanship. What party are the political executives associated with? Is it right or left, Republican uh, or Democrat? That works for the US, does that travel? A focus on partisan affiliations of governors explains a good deal of the variance in policy responses subnationally in Mexico. We saw that the Morena uh, left party affiliated with the president, Lopez Obrador, governors tended to, to implement less stringent, more permissive policies, whereas governors on the right with the PAN uh, implemented more stringent policies and independent governors also had the highest uh, scores on stringency. So there's some puzzles, however. Uh, thinking off of the US, we expect conservatives Republicans that pursue less stringent policies, whereas left liberal Democrats tend to pursue more stringent policies. In Mexico, it's the other way around. The right, the PAN, um, governors affiliated with the right pursue more stringent policies, and governors on the left with Morena are less stringent. To make things even more complicated, um, the independent governors who aren't affiliated with any party, they span the ideological spectrum. We have one on the right, one on the left, and one in the middle, and they all implement more stringent policies. So what's going on here? Brazil loosens the screws even more. We have a multi-party system, 18 effective parties, a weaker president than in Mexico, one who just recently launched his own uh, personalistic party that's still very nascent and weak. And in Brazil, neither partisan affiliation nor ideology or even alignment with the president seems to explain subnational state level policy responses. Um, so that leaves us with the question, if none of those factors explain variance in Brazil, what does? Um, next slide, please. I'm not gonna go through this. This is just a laundry list of some of the other political, uh, potential political explanations for state level policy variance that we're exploring and we'll be exploring going forward as well as some non-political factors. Um, last slide to end. The elephant in the room. So the question has been posed, does public health or politics affect, uh, sorry, do public health factors or political factors drive policies? And the answer for all political scientists seems to be, uh, well, it's really politics, not epidemiology. But I think we need to turn that question around and ask, does policy affect public health outcomes? So do these policy responses, stringent, not stringent, social distancing, do they actually influence health outcomes, which is ultimately what we care about? The premise, of course, of social distancing in the first place is that social distancing reduces mobility and that should re result in a reduction in cases of COVID-19. 
we have some preliminary results, which we can talk about if people are interested later, showing that the stringency of state level policies in Brazil and Mexico do in fact have a significant and negative impact on mobility. So more stringent policies do have the expected effect of reducing mobility. Um, whether that in turn results in better health outcomes, that remains to be, to be studied. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you very much. Uh, uh, amazing presentation on, on Latin American politics and COVID-19 certainly uh, you know, we don't know enough about, and I think this is so, so important and much needed. Uh, we have, uh, unfortunately, essentially no time for in-depth questions. Um, I'm going to take a couple, uh, and we only have a couple from the panelists that I can see. The first question is, uh, if you could briefly add, this is for the first group, uh, Chris and Bree, uh, is from David uh, Scarbeck, and the question is, how much does sub-state variation explain these outcomes? It seems that states vary tremendously in density and political support, and that would obscure important variation. Uh, one response would be to examine the county level data from California. Have, a look, have you looked at that data? Um, thank you so much, David. That's a great question. I agree with you that there is a lot of sub-state variation, especially in some of the bigger states. So um, basically our universe of policies we've been collecting is at about 4,000. Something we'd love to do in the future is to go to a granular um, county level uh, structure as I think it's a really rich area for future research, but it would require a lot more resources than we currently have. So I really agree with the question, uh, whether or not that's something we'll be able to get to is an open question. I'm just going to jump in and add a, a little bit to that as well in terms of how we would interpret that result. Um, in the case of California, a lot of the county level action is coordinated with the state. Um, in a number of other states, uh, the states have actually prevented localities from doing things that are more extreme in the state at different points. So it's a really complex pattern across the country. Uh, but I, I want to highlight links between this and the last presentation from the Brown group. We are not necessarily claiming that this is driven by ideology. Uh, and we don't really find evidence of, you know, uh, most of the variables, you know, things like tourism and, and so forth. We've tested a lot of things. Um, we think in the U.S. case, this is very much driven by people's relationship to Trump and the evolving Republican Party's relationship to Trump as a populist movement centered on a single personality. Uh, had he made different choices, we imagine our results would have been radically different. And so it's really a story about a post-ideological Republican Party that is intensely populist and personality driven. Um, and had things been different, we might not see these huge partisan differences or they could be quite distinct. Uh, and we think that's a story that has to be told at the state level because of the power of governors as executives. Great, wonderful. We have one final question here is any, uh, from an anonymous attendee, uh, any ideas about where in the Trump-led Republican body politic and or among its media patrons, these data and others of the same kind might finally find purchase. So one encouraging thing, I think, especially in the past week or two, is you've seen an increase in the number of Republican politicians very forcefully advocating for mask wearing. So there might already be a little bit of a shift in that, um, specifically Mitch McConnell, uh, Senator Rubio of Florida. Uh, so that's, I think, one encouraging sign that this is changing. Mm. Very interesting. Great, uh, thank you. Uh, it seems like those are the only two questions that I can see we've had from the, uh, the public. Um, any final questions or comments among the panelists? The Christopher, the way that you just described uh, the U.S. as post-ideological and, you know, policy very much driven, state-level policy driven by relations to the Trump-led party and so forth, I mean, it sounds quite Latin American. Yeah, no, I, 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 I as a comparativist, since that's, that's where I'm coming from, uh, you know, my guideposts for uh, understanding U.S. politics have have really switched from you know advanced industrial countries to partial democracies and semi-authoritarian states and and a variety of, of different guideposts. Uh, you know we had a large team and there are certainly different views among that group. But if you went into this with a variety of ideological theories about how Republicans would react to this, 
Um, I don't know that those have survived contact with Trump's signaling on how people should move. And the, the fact that you know, he can amplify claims like liberate such and such democratic cities when governors in his own party thinking strategically would really love to uh, basically crash this virus and recover their economies and could easily have appealed to Republican fear of disease, of, of you know, threats coming from foreign borders, any, of, any other elements of recent Republican ideology to spin this a different way, had very, very little room to develop that as a story. Um, it, it, just, it just seems to me that you could have told a variety of ideological stories is not something that was tightly bound to the previous you know, range of ideological debates in the United States. And I don't think that, that that's really how it is bound. Uh, there's a racial dimension, to the extent that you, you might believe, based on initial results, that it's not hitting yeah. traditional Republican demographics, but ideological, I'm, you know, I'm not sure it's been there. And I, so I, I found, uh, Richard, I found your results to be incredibly consistent with that story where, you know, uh, a left-wing populist party in Mexico, and the commonality here being distrust of experts uh, and a personalistic approach, um, fits with, you know, the American experience. Brazil, what I wonder, and this is a question for, for you guys, and to what extent is there fear that, that tying your mask to Bolsonaro is, is at this point politically dangerous in a way that Republicans in the United States have no choice because they're going to get primaried and the Trump movement is going to persist no matter what happens in November? There's no question that Bolsonaro is, for many reasons, a much, much weaker executive. I mean, he, the party he just created is his ninth political party in his 25 years, his 25 year political career. And he just defected six, seven months ago from the social liberal party. And that has three governors, one who is now joining him in his new party, but two who are like, well, you, you def we don't need to, we're not loyal to you. So, and he doesn't have, uh, the system doesn't give him the resources that, uh, that Mexico, for example, I mean, there's no re-election of governors in Mexico, which is important still. And therefore, one could argue that party elites have a, a more, have a stronger leverage and influence over, over governors who are thinking about where they're going next in their careers. I, um, I, I certainly can agree with that. I, I would just say that if, if and this is sort of an answer to this question, right? If Trump's support miraculously did fall through the floor. If he, if he imitated George W. Bush in terms yep. of his approval ratings, yep. I think we'd see governors jumping ship like left and right. But they're calculating right now that that's just not gonna happen. And you see leaks from Republican strategists over the last few days saying, you know, we're sensing an absolute catastrophe, but we still can't talk in our strategy meetings about this is seeing from Trump because his voters are gonna dominate the primaries. And if we become a rump party, they're gonna hold all of the power within it. So there's nowhere for us to go. Well, that's the two party system. and 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 the power of the party elites or weakness of the party elites vis-a-vis -vis the president in the U.S. Yeah. Well, this is all wonderful. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> unfortunately, we, we have gone uh, way past our time. Uh, and But these have been excellent uh, questions and answers. And, uh, and of course, if anyone else has any other questions, uh, please feel free to uh, email us, me, or I can pass them along to the panelists or email the panelists directly. Uh, but this has been a wonderful uh, 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 colloquium. I think it's been great for us as political scientists to show uh, our community here and globally what new insights the discipline of political science provides uh, for um, for our understanding of COVID-19 policy response in the U.S. internationally and in Latin America, which as Richard said is seeing uh, uh, the bulk of the cases and, and troubles right now. I just want to remind our participants that for our next uh, uh, population health equilibrium, uh, this will be on July 22nd at 3 p.m. And the topic will be health inequalities in light of COVID-19 to focus on the Lehigh Valley community. And uh, please join us for that event. There's a registration here at the bottom. And uh, finally, just a, a thank you uh, for all the panelists. Uh, certainly an honor for you, all of you to join us. It's been a, a delight having you. Uh, I've certainly learned a lot, took a lot of notes, and, uh, and I hope that the, that the participants also enjoyed the session. And again, we'll be posting this, uh, this on YouTube uh, uh, with the panelists' permission, of course, and, uh, and so that if, if any other students or uh, attendants could not see it, it'll be available later on. But thank you very much again. Uh, it's certainly been an honor and pleasure, uh, and uh, we look forward to learning more about your research uh, going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ed, and thanks to Lehigh.
Thank Thanks you. for organizing this. Thank Wonderful. you very much. Okay, take care. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.